Um. So to start with, listen. If you know what I'm doing, raise your hand. Ooh, I got to start again. Erase, erase. Here we go. Anybody recognize don't it? Say it? One. Don't say, Do, it. don't say it out loud. Just raise your hand if Three you recognize Three of you. Four. Song. Okay, here we go. Keep listening. Any more? Now it's coming. Okay, okay sing along. Yeah. Happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Okay. Is it somebody's birthday? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we assume our students know more than they do, and we go ahead and just, they have no clue what we're talking about or doing. So we always want to make sure that we know what they know in their head, and it's not just in the teacher's head. A little thing about prerequisites. We have to deal with this in every independent study course. What do they bring with them to the course? We can't assume sometimes too much, because we know it, they may not know it. Okay, William Butler Yeats said, education is not the filling of a pail. Can anybody complete that sen sentence? Say that again. Hey, good. But the lighting of a fire. Uh, coming back to Charles' presentation when he said he had his students know everything they were supposed to know perhaps about technology, but they didn't want to use it afterwards. So then Charles was really saying that is not very satisfying as a teacher, right? If they just get a grade, if they just get credit in an independent study course, what have we done? Not much. Really not much. If they get excited about the topic and want to continue on and want to expand, if their fire has been lit, then we have done something. So in every course, we ought to look at it and say, am I really helping this student get excited about this topic? Okay, when students complain about a course, I'm, I'm looking now at the actually millions of student ratings that we have at BYU. When they complain about a course, what do they complain about? You know, what are they? Let's hear it. Grades? Grades, not the most common. Grades is not the, could I say that again? Grades is not the most common thing they complain about. Yeah. Boring. 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 Okay. Not applicable. Not, not applicable. applicable. That's a huge one. So we might say not relevant or whatever. We'll come back to that. Okay. Questions are on the test, you mean? Yeah. So they might, what they usually say is this course did not really, the test did not really Mesh. measure what I learned. I wanted to demonstrate what I'd learned, but the tests really didn't do it, right? So tests were not aligned. Okay, what else? This may not apply so much to independent study courses because independent study, we have to be so explicit. But there's one other thing that in face-to-face -face courses, people complain quite a bit about. The goals. I didn't know what I was supposed to be learning. I couldn't figure out from this teacher what I was supposed to be doing, what the goal was for this course, the learning outcomes, okay? so. Now, when they rave about a course, those are things they complain about. We call them alignment. You got learning outcomes, you got activities. One thing they say, this coming back to the boring thing, is they say, this was not useful to me. I spent three hours doing this assignment and I didn't learn anything. It wasn't useful. It was really busy work. So most common thing is they say busy work. So learning outcomes, activities, and assessment. What do they rave about? That's what they complain about. When those things are in place, and so maybe you don't get that many tons of complaints, do you, Justin, about courses? Or No. Because in independent study, you've got to be pretty explicit, pretty careful. But what do they rave about? Do you get lots of raves? We get some raves. We get some raves. Try not to hold too many raves. Could you? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> could you use more raves? We all could. Yeah, could independent study use more, it could use more raves. What do students rave about? The teacher was accessible and helpful. Okay, so the teacher was accessible and helpful, so they got contact with the teacher. Good. Coming yeah. back to that applicable thing, it's relevant, they rave about that. They say, this is so relevant to my life. Sometimes they say, this is so real, I, I can see how I can use this every day. Okay. Turning knowledge into experience. So this is more of this back to applicable, relevant, yeah, we call it linking it to the life. What other things, learn. when you've taken a course, what, do you, what did you love about it? 
any course. The teacher. The teacher. So Charles Personal. This comes back to this humanness aspect, this idea of this relationship between the teacher and the learner. Okay? So should we pass these out now? Oh, yeah, we'll get these. Okay. So we call this this little diagram lighting the fire. This comes from our book, and we have a copy of it for you, or you can find it on a line at our site, choosetolearn.net. But we, we have do a copy have a of this diagram for you, for you. so you don't yeah. need to copy it down. Um, so, is it linked? Are the outcomes, activities, and assessments are they linked to each other and to the life of the learner? This is the relevancy thing. If you, we do nothing more in a class and make it relevant, this will help light the fire for students. How do you do this as a teacher? You have to so, show your students, whether they're online or not, your passion. The first presenter, our English one, you could feel her passion, couldn't you? Oh my goodness. I was ready to take ninth grade English again, because I want to see that other video. <laughs> <laughs> but she didn't show me, you know. I, I, you, as an instructor, can show that passion through videos or your comments or whatever, but it has to be there. And link it to your life, and so that the students can link it to their life. Why your subject matter is the most important thing there is in the whole world for anyone to learn. So whether it's chemistry or whatever, it's got to be the most important thing. And you as an instructor, you have to be able to expound that to your students somehow. What I ask faculty, and I'll ask you right now, um, how do you help students understand that they absolutely cannot live without what you're teaching them? That they really can't live without it. They've got to have this. And, I, and, and again, I'm not back to just filling a requirement for GE or, or whatever it might be, or filling a requirement to get the GED in this case. Um, how do you convince them they can't live without what you're teaching them? So just talk to a min for a minute with the person next to you about that. What do you do in your course to show students that this thing is the most important thing they've ever studied before? Show some yeah. passion to the person next to you why your course is more important than their course even. <laughs> <laughs> Go. Terrific. Okay. This is something worth thinking about. Not just as you write the course, the whole way through, how are you helping students understand that they just can't live without this thing? This is so important and that you personally are excited about it. So you have to make the assignments challenging, but not too challenging that they fail, but they do, and they have to feel your excitement as you do those, as they do those or assignments, and they have to be structured so that they are challenging for them, because if they're not, they're boring, and it's just busy work. And so somehow you've got to find that balance of challenging but not too, but no, it has to be challenging enough so that they are successful and can attain it. This third one there, uh, inspiring. This is another thing that students rave about when they have a great course. What they usually say are things like this. This course changed my life somehow. This professor changed my life. I will never think about such and such in exactly the same way. This thing changed me somehow. It was inspiring. I want to do better. I want to reach. So whatever we can do in our courses to do that, let's figure out how to do it. Let me just come back for a second to Charles' um, example of, he, he didn't mention the word, but it's called digital dialogue. This is our name for this tool now. Uh, so this is the asynchronous video, text, or audio feedback tool. Has anybody used that in here yet? It's just barely been made beta right now, so probably not. This should be available. Um, it's going to be available to all the campus in the fall. It's available at BYU Hawaii right now. Um, so this allows you to give asynchronous video, audio, or text feedback to students with you there, your real face, on this little compressed video thing talking to them. And you saw the data that he presented. This is a very, students respond very well to this. It makes this independent study course that is kind of, uh, I don't know, this distant thing. They can't see the faculty member. They've never shaken hands with the faculty member. They, but now this faculty member is right in front of them on the screen. I, just for interest's sake, th because this is a tool that the Center for Teaching and Learning is releasing this fall. Center for Teaching and Learning is located on the south um, west corner of the library, and that's where you go in. You don't go in in the main entrance of the library, but if you ever want to come and visit us, you're certainly welcome. Um, 
how many would be interested in trying digital dialogue? I'm just interested in seeing hands. Okay. Okay. I'll just have to say, knowing I've done independent study courses before myself, if I were to do another one right now, I would want to use digital dialogue uh, because it would allow me face time, in a sense, with the student without killing me time-wise because I can do it whenever I want to. I can do it when I'm just before I go to bed, I can record a few things and say, I just read your paper and this is what I think and you can pay attention to these three things. It takes me two seconds and I load it up and send it off and, and the student gets it. Okay. Okay, now, education does not become exciting until both learners and teachers accomplish something they previously thought was impossible. If you want to light somebody's fire, they have got to approach a task like this. They've got to look at it and say, say it was the, Arab where's the Arabic? Yeah, our Arabic course, um, who presented. Um, if someone says, I, there's no way I could ever learn Arabic. That is way beyond me. I can't get those letters straight. and That is just too difficult. But then there's some reason to do it, and they say, I'm going to try. Now, if they try, and they succeed at this thing, this is what changes people's lives. When they overcome, when they actually achieve something, they thought initially was out of reach, was impossible. So, how many, how many have read this story? This ring a bell? Elder Featherstone told okay. it at a conference 30 years ago. Uh, I, we just reread it in Larry Miller's book, Driven. It's, it's, it was his story at the end. Uh, you can download it. It's a great story, a motivator for you. Um, it's about a, a woman who helps a, a young person mow her lawn. She was quite formidable. She uh, paid him 50 cents the first time he did it. Uh, and after he did it, she went out and showed him all the things he was to do. He had to go over it again two or three times. He had to do this and that and this and that. And then he finally paid her, or she finally paid him $2 and uh, said, and perhaps you could get better and do more. And at, at some point you might be able to do, but it's pretty impossible. And, Maybe someday you could do a $4 job, but a $5 job is an impossible, and that was how she left it. He came back week after week. Most he could ever get was $2 until he finally gave it his all and got 3 and then it was three fifty, and he kept in that mode for so long until one day he woke up and decided, I can do this, and he found the way. And there was some mentoring going on in this story. It is applicable to teachers and students but a great motivating kind of story that you might want to read and uh, uh, even maybe use with your uh, students in any, in any setting, but it's, uh, why don't you just go ahead. Okay. I like this quote at the end. This was a favorite story of Larry H. Miller, so we kind of encountered this story again in uh, his biography called Driven. It says, whenever something in you says it's impossible, remember to take a careful look. See if it isn't really God asking you to grow an inch or a foot or a mile that you may come to a fuller life. Now, here's the, other, here's the opposite side of this, and we talk about this in the book. When a student signs up for an independent study course, are there any that don't finish? Yeah. There's some that don't finish. Why do they not finish? For one reason or another, they say, this is impossible. I can't fit it into my time. It's too difficult. I can't understand it. There might be a hundred reasons. But for whatever reason, they say, no, I just can't do it. Then, in a sense, I don't know, when people do this, they wanted to do it or they wouldn't have signed up for it. They wouldn't have paid money for it. They wanted to do it originally, and then look what happens. They just, <laughs> something dies inside of us when this happens, I believe. When we really want to do something, and then we fail at it. We call it in our book, Addiction to Failure. And we've got millions and millions of people out there who say, no. It's like in the, we used to play the Hoosier movie clip. Little Ollie says, I'm not no good. I'm just not no good at that. <laughs> we've got lots of people who say this. I'm not very good at Arabic or at English or whatever it is. And so I can't do it. Something dies inside of us. But when we take on that challenge and we go beyond it and we say, wow, I did that. Something grows inside of us. And this is what we're trying to do with lighting the fire. One of the best things.